I do care what you do with this information because it is important to our survival as a species. It's important to our planet. It is important for the world. This presentation will address the statements like, all religions are basically the same, and all religions are different paths to God. In one sense, this is true, and in one sense, it's false. It's false because the religions in the world are at odds about very key issues. That is, they claim certain things that, if true, would make the others false. Some claim that there are many gods. Some claim that there is only one. Some claim you can become a god. Some claim that you cannot. Some claim that Jesus was God. Some claim that he was not God, but only a good teacher or a prophet. Some claim that hell exists. Some say that it does not. Some claim that you will be judged for your sins before a holy God. Some say that there is no repercussion for your actions. At the very least, we must admit that this means that some religions are false in their view about God and salvation. It does not prove that any particular one is right, but it does show that there must be a lot of false religions if they are claiming contradictory things about these fundamental issues. There is another sense in which this claim, the one about all major religions being basically the same, is true. I also believe that this same thing that makes them all the same in one sense also explains why all major religions exist in the first place. All major religions like Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism believe that there is something wrong or broken with the human soul and they are trying with various systems and rituals and practices to fix this problem. The problem that they are all trying to deal with is the problem of personal sin. Now they call it by various names but define it in almost identical terms. They are all trying to reach a place where they are free from the bondage of sin and the cycle that sin causes. And I will show that not only do all religions claim to be trying to deal with sin as their reason for existence, they also admit that they have no answer for it. Allow me to prove this point first, as I can imagine that some of you would have some objections on this point. Within Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, I don't think that this point needs much proving. Most would agree that the concept of sin is of primary importance within these religions. So let's move on to Buddhism. What Buddhists will agree on is that the goal of Buddhism is to attain nirvana, which is the ending of ignorance, as they say, of something called dependent origination, thus escaping what is seen as a cycle of suffering and rebirth. This cycle of suffering is called samsara. And before we look more into this, notice that the purpose of Buddhism is to be free of samsara. The very definition of nirvana is the absence of samsara. So the whole religion is based on getting out or getting rid of something, not attaining something. This obviously presupposes an inherent or inborn problem that needs a solution. So let's look a little closer. The word samsara refers to the process of continuous pursuit or flow of life or the continuous but random drift of passions, desires, emotions, and experiences. Samsara is continuous suffering, or what they call dukkha. When Buddhists talk about being free from suffering or dukkha, they are talking about suffering that is a part of samsara. Now this is where it gets interesting. Buddha gave what are called the Four Noble Truths. The second one tells us what the cause of suffering or dukkha is. He says it's tana, here translated as the word craving. In the Dukkha Samudaya, the suffering's origin, it says, this is the noble truth of the origin of suffering. It is this tana, or craving, which leads to the renewed existence, accompanied by delight and lust, seeking delight here and there, that is, craving for sensual pleasures, craving for existence, craving for extermination. Let's look a little closer at tana. Tana literally means thirst and it figuratively denotes, quote, unwholesome desire or craving. Craving for objects which provide pleasant feelings or cravings for sensory pleasures. It's a term for wishing to have or wishing to obtain. It also encompasses the negative, as in wishing not to have. It is sometimes taken as interchangeable with the term addiction, except that that would be too narrow of a view. 
So, Buddhists are trying various methods to free themselves of their inborn, unwholesome desires or cravings. In fact, the very pinnacle of Buddhism is to attain a state, nirvana, which is defined as freedom from the cycle of suffering, which is caused, according to Buddha, by those cravings for unwholesome things. Now, let's take a look at Hinduism. Hinduism is almost identical to Buddhism in terms of its ultimate goal. In Hinduism's case, it is also to achieve a nirvana-like state called moksha, and it literally means release. Moksha is the liberation from samsara again, which is the cycle of rebirth which is considered suffering. That should sound pretty familiar by now. Again, the cause of suffering of samsara in Hinduism is worldly desires. What keeps humanity captive in samsara is something called avidya. This means ignorance or deception. One author said this about avidya. It is ignorance about the nature of being. It is a limitation that is natural to human sensory or intellectual apparatus. This is responsible for all misery of humanity. Notice again that this is an inborn problem of all people. Something is wrong with us according to Hinduism. One quote from Contemporary Hinduism, Ritual, Culture, and Practice, and The Essentials of Hinduism, a comprehensive overview, says the following, quote, Perfect unselfishness and knowledge of self as the attainment of perfect mental peace, as a detachment from worldly desires. Such realization liberates one from samsara and ends the cycle of rebirth. In other words, you need to have a perfect righteousness in regard to your selfhood or ego and detachment from your worldly desires. And again, this freedom from your natural broken state is the goal of all life, according to Hinduism. We're going to come back to Hinduism and Buddhism when we look at the probability of attaining freedom in either of these religions. But first, I want to take a look at the ancient Greeks. The Hellenistic or Greek philosophies are very ancient, almost 600 BC, and Stoicism was the most successful of all of them. And we'll look more closely at it in a moment, but first let's look at Cynicism, because Stoicism was heavily influenced by Cynicism. Cynicism had the principal goal of freedom from suffering, just like the rest of these religions. What was the suffering caused by, according to the Cynic philosophers? Quote, suffering is caused by false judgments of value, which cause negative emotions and vicious character, end quote. So first, notice the parallels. Much like Hinduism and Buddhism, they believed that suffering was caused by ignorance or deception, and that ignorance caused negative emotions or immoral or vicious behavior. I looked up that word vicious, and it perfectly describes what we would call sinful behavior. Addicted to or characterized by vice, grossly immoral, depraved, uh, a vicious life, given or readily disposed to evil, or reprehensible, blameworthy, wrong. So, once again, all suffering, according to them, is caused by sin. And the religion was trying to free themselves from their predisposition to react sinfully. This eventually bred Stoicism, which again has the primary goal to be, quote, free from anger, envy, and jealousy. One of the most famous Stoics, Epictetus, said this, Freedom is secured not by fulfilling of men's desires, but by the removal of desire. The idea that there is something wrong with us inherently, and the quests to be liberated from the sinful desires is so prevalent, because, might I suggest, it's so obvious. Take, for example, a small child. We all know that the word mine is one of the first words that a child learns, and that if that child is never told no or disciplined, its natural disposition is to be an unruly child. Our default nature is not to be good, and the whole world seems to know it. The Bible, while noting the moral depravity of the culture in Romans 1, 24-31, points out that the people live immorally, while at the same time knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, verse 31. In the Bible's view, the problem with people is not so much that they do not know right from wrong, but that they do know right from wrong, and do wrong despite knowing better. Romans 2.15 says, They show that what the law requires is written in their hearts, a fact to which their own consciences testify, and their thoughts will either accuse or excuse them. 
Now, where you start to get the wide variation in world religions and practices is when you start to talk about their different methods for getting rid of that sinful heart. There are all kinds of traditions and rituals and practices that attempt to achieve their stated goals, to reach the place of freedom from the suffering caused by sin. It is in the methods of trying to attain their goal that makes, say, Buddhism different than Hinduism. But really, even in that, they are very similar. All three of the religions that we've mentioned so far do this by various types of what's known as aestheticism. This includes various things like abstinence from various sorts of worldly pleasures, or meditation, or certain diets, even flogging oneself. Basically, religion. The concern I have is this. Let's say you were in one of these three religions we mentioned, Hinduism, Buddhism, or some type of Stoicism, and you were doing all these religious practices as good as you possibly could. Let's say you decided to be a monk or a yogi and sell everything you had and live on top of a mountain, eat only rice or whatever, and meditate all the time. Would it work? Would you solve the problem? In other words, what is the success rate? Do any of these religions claim to achieve their goals? Let's start with Buddhism. How often do Buddhists achieve nirvana? These people would be called arhats. The oldest teachings of Buddhism teach that an arhat is free from all defilements, without greed, hatred, delusion, ignorance, and that craving we talked about. There's quite a lot of debate among Buddhists as to whether there are any arhats alive today. Here are some quotes from a discussion found in the most popular online community of Buddhists. Notice the variation of answers and the complete uncertainty of whether or not any exist at all. First, quote, My guess is that if any arhats are alive today, they would be in robes. Even in the Buddha's time, it was very rare for a layperson to achieve arhatship. The moderator of this forum said, I think that the simple answer is that we can guess and give our own opinions, but there is no documented, officially recognized, globally accepted enlightened being, and as such, all discussion is conjecture. Another person said, I would like to believe that arhatship is achievable in this lifetime for most, if not all of us, if we really are diligent in our practice. This is based on absolutely no solid evidence whatsoever, just a hunch. Another person said something very interesting. They said, a Buddhist monk here in Australia once talked about this in one of his Dharma talks during a meditation retreat. He asked if there were any arhats alive today. He made the statement that, of course there were, and if he didn't think that there were any, the Buddhist path would not be worth following. He didn't go into how many there were, but when I spoke to him about this privately later, he told me that he knew of three, quote, stream enterers in Australia, all monks, of course, by the way, a stream enterer refers to the first stage of arhathood. Some noble characteristics emerge, it is said, and they have up to seven more lifetimes as a human. Okay, so then the person continues, that's it, three. As for fully awakened arhats, clearly the implication was that they didn't exist in Australia. I would think that you would have to go deep into Thailand or Burma and maybe Sri Lanka to find arhats, and even then, I don't think you would find too many. So, this speaker basically said that Buddhism is not worth following if it doesn't work, yet, when pressed, he didn't seem to know any instances of it working, and instead offered a handful of people who were kind of close. But, of course, how could you verify such a claim anyway? Now, there are some that would claim that achieving nirvana is common and easy, and they do this, essentially, by redefining what nirvana is. This is especially true in the New Age, where they equate spiritual experiences and supernatural things and emotions such as the Kundalini experience as achieving enlightenment. And they may indeed believe that, but that would be inconsistent with the Buddhist idea of freedom from samsara. In Hinduism, it's the same story. Sure, there's a lot of gurus out there, some of which even claim to have attained moksha and are free from worldly desires, but here again, even if you believe that the guru had actually attained freedom from this bondage of ignorance, as they might say, you would still have to admit that it is a fantastically rare occurrence, even among those that are trying to follow all the religious rules and aesthetic practices. Enter reincarnation. A religion that could not deliver on its stated reason for existence could not last. People would eventually walk away from it, much like the Stoics did. In fact, the only fundamental difference between Stoicism and these religions is the concept of reincarnation. 
the concept of reincarnation in Hinduism and Buddhism essentially delays the inevitable question, what's the purpose of doing this if it doesn't work? They are essentially told that it's not supposed to work, or most likely won't work in one lifetime, and it could take up to 80,000 or so. So don't expect to actually be free from the bondage of sin that humanity suffers from. It kind of makes one's life seem to be less important. I mean, it's really not that big a deal. Sure, you could work really hard at being religious if you want. It won't get you there, but you might be closer next time. At the same time, you can just coast through life and have the I'll do it later mindset. This is where those fundamental differences in the religions comes in. What if it's true that we only have one life, and that it's really valuable, and that we only have one shot at it? Now let's shift gears entirely and look at Islam. 1.3 to 1.6 billion people follow Islam. While Islam has no trouble with the concept of sin, and have elaborate lists and different types and levels of sin, unlike the other religions, there is no hope of freedom whatsoever from the desire to sin. The heart of a man will continue to desire just as much to sin, no matter how committed the person is to following the religion. The thing in Islam is therefore constant repentance. One of the hadiths say, O people, turn to Allah in repentance and seek his forgiveness, for surely I make repentance a hundred times every day. And this repentance, if it is genuine, according to a Muslim, will be accepted to a point. Muhammad said, Allah accepts the repentance of his servant so long as death has not reached his collarbone. It does no good to argue whether Islam works or not, like we did with the other religions, because there is no claim from Islam to be able to attain freedom from the desire to sin in the first place. In addition, there is never any assurance that they would ever be shown mercy by Allah, even if they were incredibly devoted religiously. Even Muhammad said that he did not know if he would be shown mercy from Allah. In Judaism, it also requires strict obedience to the law. It does, however, have provisions for forgiveness in the form of sacrifice if you are not able to keep the law perfectly. And even though there is no changed heart associated with either the keeping of the law or the forgiveness of sins in Judaism, it does have a unique characteristic in that it has many prophecies in their scriptures that a new heart would one day be made possible because God was going to make a new covenant or agreement with mankind at some point. Jeremiah 31, 31 says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Now, we find in the New Testament book of Hebrews that this prophecy was for the entire human race as well. So this new agreement was going to be altogether different than the previous one. We will see as we look at some of these prophecies that this new covenant that was prophesied would actually change the heart of people. It was said that a changed nature was going to be possible, that not just a resisting of sin, but a genuine heart-level hatred of sin instead of a love for it was going to occur, and a thirst and an ability for holiness and a desire for God himself was going to happen. Notice also as I read some of these how it is said that this will be accomplished, that is, by God putting his spirit in us. Ezekiel 37, 26 through 27 says, Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. I will set my sanctuary in their midst forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Indeed, I will be their God, and they will be my people. Jeremiah 31, 33 says, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. In the next chapter, in verse 40, it says, And I will make an everlasting covenant with them, and I will not turn away from doing them good, but I will put my fear, or reverence, in their hearts, so that they will not depart from me. Again, in Ezekiel 36, 26 and 27, it says, I will give to you a new heart, and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh, and give you a heart of flesh. Christianity is simply this new covenant that was prophesied in these Old Testament passages. In fact, the words New Testament, referring to the Christian scriptures, literally means new covenant. Jesus said that this new heart, given as a result of God's indwelling, is called being born again. In John chapter 3, verse 3, it says, Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
And we find that the Christian is someone to whom this has occurred. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Something really interesting is also said in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, where it says, In him, speaking of Christ, you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. The Spirit there is the same one that the old prophecies were talking about. It was by God giving us his Spirit at the moment of repentance and belief in the gospel that accomplishes his purpose of changing our hearts. The gospel is not only the method in which God forgave us, but it is also the reason he is now able to indwell us in this new covenant. Although I explain this in much more detail in my video, What Do I Have to Do to Be Saved?, the gospel is summed up in this verse in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he, that is God, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So God put your sin on his son and crushed him in your place so that God's justified holy wrath could be satisfied totally. And for the first time he could see men as righteous and he could not just forgive them but forget their sin and therefore dwell in them. If we repent and believe this good news we too can enter into this new covenant of freedom and forgiveness and a new nature with God. This is what Christ meant when he said, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. The new covenant makes God's indwelling possible. This is why 1 Corinthians says to the Christians, Do you not know that you are a temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? And the evidence of this happening is only found in the dramatic changes of one's heart and actions. The Bible is quick to say, if somebody claims to be a Christian, but you don't see any of the evidence of it, they're clearly not a Christian. Listen carefully to the types of things in this next verse, and these are the opposites of the evil nature that all the religions we looked at said were keeping us in samsara. Galatians 5.22 and 23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So these things are the so-called fruit of the Spirit. That is, if you have the Spirit of God in you, these things will develop over time. It's the only evidence we have of whether a person is a Christian or not. The ironic thing is that in Christianity, you don't try and try until you achieve the new heart. The new heart is the only way to get in in the first place. It's actually the starting line which is completely different than all the other religions. In fact, the other religions have a bit of an ironic paradox. That is, when you do aesthetic practices like meditate and eat only the right foods and do all the religious things that they do, it kind of develops something I call meditation stripes, a kind of religious pride, a belief that they are more superior than others because of their devotion to their religion. But this actually destroys any possibility of that ego developing. In Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Romans 3, 26 and 27 says this, To demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he may be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. After this new heart was given to me, and it started to become obvious that I had been given this new love, this desire for good and a hatred for sin, it became just as clear that I did not earn it. There was nothing I could have done to achieve such a change. One of the best passages of all time on this is in Titus 3, verses 3-7. through 7. It says, For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God, 
our Savior towards man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Also, for more on this, Romans chapter 6 is all about this topic. So read that whole chapter if you want to know more. One way to demonstrate my point that unlike other religions, not only does Christianity claim to solve the problem of bondage to sin, but it delivers, and delivers on the order of hundreds and even thousands per day, is to appeal to your experiences with true Christians. I bet that a large portion of you know people that you know used to be a total wreck and live lives governed by sin that have completely changed because of Jesus. You might not understand it, you may have rationalized that they went crazy. I mean, how else can you explain such a 180 degree turn? But you know them. You probably know a few of them. Again, I'm not talking about someone that started going to church or got religious. Being in a church doesn't make you a Christian any more than being in a garage makes you a car. In fact, Jesus was probably one of the most anti-religious people that ever existed. I'm talking about someone that you have looked in their eyes and know from the bottom of your heart that they aren't the same person that you once knew, and you see that they have attained a peace that surpasses all understanding. I think that the reason all the religions know that they are sinful is because what the Bible says is true. He has put in everyone's heart the knowledge of his laws. Therefore, when they rebel against him, they know instinctively that they are condemning themselves. And that is why all the religions are seeking to answer the sin problem. The problem is, is that they all are so busy with deeds, with striving to act good, with only a slight hope of ever being good. The Bible speaks to them in this way. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. If you want to know more about what the Bible says about salvation, see my videos, What Do I Have to Do to Be Saved, and Legalism Debunked. These two videos, I think, will give you a solid overview of why it can be claimed that a man that lived 2,000 years ago could be said to make this new covenant with God possible. Thank you for your time.